Well, good evening, everybody. Um, Lord and Lady Hesseltine, um, students, colleagues, and welcome to our, our discussion this evening. And welcome to, to all those who are joining us by uh, live stream uh, this evening. We hope that this adventure into hybrid events will prove successful and that you will feel part of this evening's uh, very special um, events. It's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, our speaker for the evening. Lord Hasseltine will be known to many as one of the leading British political figures of the late uh, 20th century. Following a time in national service in the Welsh Guards and a series of business ventures that culminated in him becoming founder and chairman of the Haymarket Group, Lord Hesseltine served as a member of parliament for nearly four decades. He was a cabinet minister in various departments before being appointed Deputy Prime Minister and First Secretary of State from 1995 to 1997. And since leaving the House of Commons in 2001, he served in the House of Lords as an advisor to the Secretary of State for Communities and Local Growth and a commissioner on the National Infrastructure Commission. He's published multiple reports, a political autobiography, and among others, a book about the creation of the benefit of gardens, co written with Lady Hesseltine, whom we also have the privilege of welcoming at this time. Lord Hesseltine's leadership qualities were recognised long before his days in the Commons by a teacher at Shrewsbury School, who wrote to Pembroke recommending him for consideration for the 1951 entry um, to the college. He describes Lord Hesseltine as a, quote, most unusual boy with very remarkable amount of vitality and initiative. Going on to express his firm belief that this boy will go a long way uh, in the future. And it is important that he should go to Oxford yes. or Cambridge. Well, Lord Hesseltine uh, did indeed secure a place for study PPE uh, here at Pendle. And despite his teacher's prediction that he might well be a leading member of the junior column, the young man's sights were set outside of the college on the Oxford Union. His tutor's reports testified to the time and energy he dedicated to his various committee positions there, where he was eventually elected president in 1954. And during his time here, he also founded a long establishment conservative society called the Ribbon Club. I'd forgotten that and I went back just to think about my time in the other place. When I met Lord Hesseltine as the chair of an inter interview panel for aspiring politicians, I didn't follow his lead, hence he is where he is and I am where I am uh, now. But in 1997, when he was chairing that parallel process in Cambridge, we'd invented something called Moderation, which was a tripartite political grouping uh, where Robert Harris in the Labour label Group, uh, myself in the bits um, in between, and various leading politicians who have recently been governed under the Conservatives and uh, were all participants and uh, members of uh, the circle of history just go around and around. That same vitality and initiative with which he was credited in the 1950s, uh, later, three decades later, earned Lord Hesseltine an unofficial title, the one that's close to my heart in the Northwest, Minister for Merseyside. Uh, and that was for his bold reform projects in that area of the country. Taking himself the adopted son of Liverpool, he drove a renaissance in that city, seeing the transformation of the Albert Dock and the staging of an international garden festival. He has long advocated the importance of local government and constructed a framework for regional revival um, elsewhere. Determined to see government offices in the regions flourish against the scepticism of some of the colleagues. He was living up to his old teacher's verdict, but as in common with a boy who was full of ideas, he's had minor differences of opinion with authority. And all the better, for that if I may say so. His dedication to the regeneration of the area has been recognized in his receipt of the freedom uh, of Liverpool in 2021 and election to honorary fellowship of John Moore's University 
in 2013. It's not only Liverpool that benefited from Lord Heseltine's rejuvenating uh, efforts. During his time in office, Lord and Lady Heseltine were planning and planting the gardens of our cottages and food house. They've restored 40 acres of woodland to create what is now a 70 acre arboretum of more than 3,500 species of trees and shrubs. Many hand selected by them, and Lord Hesseltine remains a king gardener and is vice president of the Royal Horticultural Society <coughs> and a member of the Royal Forestry Society. Alongside her contribution uh, to the gardens, Lady Hesseltine is a donor to and honorary fellow of the Ashburn Museum and has made a distinguished friend of Oxford in recognition of her contribution to the museum's uh, intense fundraising activities. She's also an honorary fellow of Royal Holiday in, in the University of London. It's my very great pleasure to welcome back uh, Lord and Lady Hesseltine uh, tonight, and I'm very pleased to say that Lord Hesseltine has agreed to take a few questions at the conclusion of his talk. So may I now hand over to him, and I will now be happy to say we look forward to hearing um, what he has to say about a world term of I'm delighted to come with my wife to share this evening with you. Uh, in, in thinking about what I was going to say, I, I thought I would try to put the substance of my talk tonight in a rather personal context. And looking around this uh, audience, uh, I'm glad I did, because much of the first few minutes will be about what I thought and did at your age. Uh, my father served in the British Army during the war and came back to Swansea to take up his job in a civil engineering company uh, after the war. He, like uh, one would expect of a father to whom I was devoted, wanted me to become articled to a firm of chartered accountants in Swansea. And that would have meant five years graduation. For reasons which I have no explanation for at all, I said to him, look, I think there's a six-year course, which is three years at the university and three years then in article to a firm of accountants. Do you think I could try and do that? And he agreed. Uh, the easy way of doing it was to go to a specialist university um, who offered a, a business type course. And so we applied to Reading and Bristol, who made it a condition of acceptance that I did rather well in higher school certificates, which we had at that time. Uh, an innate sense of caution told me that this wasn't the wise way forward. I said, well, can I not go to Oxford or Cambridge? And uh, I had never heard of that reference that you generously read out. But I was interviewed by both Oxford and Cambridge and offered places at John's Cambridge and uh, um, uh, Pembroke Oxford. So uh, without doubt, that was a formative moment of my life, coming to Pembroke. The day I got here, I joined the Oxford University Conservative Association. I joined the City of Oxford Conservative Association, and I joined the Oxford Union. So something down there gave a clear indication that where my interests were. Uh, 10 days before, coming up to Oxford, I had actually joined the Swansea West Conservative Association for the campaign then of the 1951 general election. Um, three years, presidency of the Oxford Union, incredible privilege. Um, and then, uh, of course, the second half of my articles 
took me to London. And I had a thousand pounds, which uh, I had the post office savings bank book. My grandparents had deposited three and six, two shillings, five shillings, whatever it may be, over many years to the point at which I had a thousand pounds. I was going to be paid seven pounds a week by uh, Pete Marwitz, the accountant to whom I was to be article. And that was double what most article clerks got at the time, because Pete's had decided they were going to try and attract graduates, of which I was self-evidently one. And um, they therefore turned the three pounds to seven pounds. But that was half of what newly graduated people earned at the time. The average earnings of people coming down from Oxford was about £600 a year, about £12, £13 a week. So I had £7 a week plus £1,000. And I worked out very rapidly that three years left me with about £300 a year, £6 a week to add to my £7 a week. I could live broadly at the same level of existence as my peer group. And here, one of the moments that transformed my life. But I said, I won't have a thousand pounds. So I found a friend who had been with me here at Oxford in this college. He had a thousand pounds. And his father knew about London property and he found us a boarding house. And for, I think it was 3,750 pounds, we bought a 13 year lease in 39 Clanricard Gardens for 11 bedroom boarding house. We lived in two of the rooms and left the other nine at three pounds each a week, which you will rapidly have worked out is 27 pounds divided into two is 13 pounds on top of my seven pounds. So I was living like a king. Um, a year later, we sold the boarding house for £5,750. And that was a profit. So our £1,000 had now become £2,000. And we bought a 40 bedroom hotel on a huge mortgage. Huge mortgage. Uh, little by little, I became more involved in the property business, which in London was pretty exciting at that time. And uh, uh, I made a terrible mistake. Ever anxious to make more money, I was persuaded to employ a, the son of a friend from Swansea who was a builder. Because I said, look, we're doing all this property business. Why do we let the builders make a profit as well? Why don't we make a profit? And so um, they... Uh, we started a building business on top of the property business. It was a monumental disaster. But I, so often out of disaster can come a good benefit because the guy we had employed to run the thing was hopeless. So we decided not long any longer to muck about with the small time stuff, let's do it properly. So we found an executive from one of the great construction companies and he said, oh, playing around. No, no, we've got to do the thing, go for big time. So we put in a bid to the London Borough of Stepney um, to build council houses. Unfortunately, we won the bid at a price probably about half what the job cost. And uh, we were faced with the bankruptcy of the building company. I was not prepared to allow anyone who traded with me to go bust, to lose money. And so we had to find a way of completing the council houses in Stepney. I don't know if you've ever come across the phenomenon, but basically in the building industry, you do what you do for a month and then you turn up with a certificate and you say, that's what we've done, can we have the money? So that's what I did. I had a, a foreman, wonderful Cockney, and uh, he told me that you did it trade by trade. You've got someone to put the foundations in. 
I'd turn up with the bill to Stepney, I said, I've done the foundation. Next, you bring the brickies in. The brickies build up the walls, go along to Stepney and get the money. But the message that comes out of this extraordinary story, this narrow squeak, you might have worked it out as being, is that I actually knew quite a bit about the property business and the building business, personally having lived on the, uh, the knife edge of sanity as I fought to pay the bills uh, of the rest of the activity. But I learned something there. In 1959, I went into the Welsh Guards, National Service. But before that, one day, um, the hotel that I was running, a friend, another friend from Oxford, rang and said, look, I've bought a business. Would you, I'd like your advice. We had a sort of, he, he, he'd owned the Charwell newspaper when he was here and I'd been a director of Charwell. So he said, I'd like your advice. And we went, I, I got a cab and he said, look, this is what I've bought. And he showed me um, a, a directory of opportunities. I'm sorry, it was a, 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 a thing about this size which was distributed free to all new graduate, new undergraduates in the university. And it was full of adverts for cinemas, for restaurants, anything that was the leisure time of undergraduate activity. Tucked into the back of it was a loose leaf insert called Directory of Opportunities for Graduates. And the Directory of Opportunities for Graduates had consisted of 16 pages of advertising at 40 pounds a page. And so you arrived at Oxford, you bought yourself a two and sixpenny, I think it was, booklet to tell you how to live slightly outside college life. And you got given a career guide to whom, which of the great British companies you could apply for a job. And he showed me this and I said, Clive, that's mad. These kids have just come up to university. They're not thinking about getting a job in three years time. What you should do, I said, was to give this directive of opportunities to every last year undergraduate in the country. He said, oh, it's a good idea. Why don't you join me? I was in publishing and the 60,000, sorry, the, 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 the uh, um, adverts that were 40 times 16 in the first year, the next year was 60,000 pounds. And that was an incredible leap, it made us a great deal of money. So here was I in um, uh, done national service. I, had, I was running a, a, a curious business of all sorts of different activities. And at the same time, in 1959, I fought the hopeless, well, from a conservative point of view, seat in Gala, where there was an enormous Labour majority in South Wales. Um, uh, needless to say, I lost. In 1964, I fought Coventry North, lost narrowly. And in 1966, I fought and won the, the oldest constituent in the country. Drake was once a member, but Tavistock in the West Country. I, the 1966 election was a disaster for the Conservative Party. It was wonderful for me because so many of the old guys lost their seats or because they'd been in power a long time, they were anxious to retire and make some money and all that sort of thing. So the 66 parliament wasn't actually imbued with people queuing up to give their life to the service of opposition. I was available. And within three months, I was on the conservative front bench working for Peter Walker, who was uh, one of the most influential politicians in, in my life. Um, he, uh, for the first three months, I did transport. Ted Heath brought the transport, housing, uh, and public works into the environment department, and I was under Graham Page doing planning. 
So uh, I was following a classic pattern. Born in the provinces, educated Oxford, moved to London, beginning to climb the ladders that were available there. And uh, there's only one memory, I think, of significance about the three months. No, I'm sorry. I then became, uh, having done transport for three months, I then became uh, a number, the junior minister to Graham Page in the planning part of the Department of the Environment. And um, whilst I was there, I looked at the south bank of the Thames, and uh, I had, uh, I knew about Paris, and I knew a, a little about architecture, and I was appalled at what we were doing to the south bank of the Thames. I mean, one of the great Western waterscapes, and the architecture was appalling. So I asked officials to prepare for me a development corporation to take over in public ownership the land on the south bank of the Thames in central London. And I was going to do the master man, the house man of Paris in, in another generation. Um, I was promoted to be Minister of Aerospace, perhaps because they got whisper of what I was planning to do with the South Bank of the Thames. And for the next two years under Ted's government, I was Minister of Aerospace. We lost the 74 election, and I worked then as Environment Secretary, Shadow, for Margaret Thatcher, until we actually won the 1979 election. And one of the first things that happened to me when I joined the cabinet after that as Secretary of State for the Environment is that the permanent secretary came to see me and said, look, your predecessor, Peter Shaw, has been concerned with inner city development and renovation. And he has established partnerships for his ministers with several of the cities which have the biggest single problem uh, in uh, dealing with urban deprivation. Would you like to consider that? I said, yeah, fine, why not? So I became a partner of Liverpool. Um, the second thing that had happened is that uh, as Minister of Aerospace, I had been charged with building an airport, the third London airport on Maplin Sands in Essex. We never did it, the House of Commons quite rightly stopped us, but the fact is I was the minister responsible. And so I used to fly over the east end of London to get there. So I knew of the devolution of 6,000 acres of stone's throw from the city of London that had been created, first by no private sector housing, by the docks having moved downstream, and by the utilities, gas and electricity, all having redeveloped there elsewhere. 6,000 acres of dereliction. I, uh, I said to the permanent secretary, when I was last here, I asked officials to develop a development corporation to take over the south bank of the Thames. I've changed my mind. We're going to take over 6,000 acres in the east of London. Uh, everybody was against me. Uh, the officials were totally against me because they said it was an intrusion into local government and they saw themselves as a custodian of the interests of local government. Geoffrey Howe was against me as chancellor because he said it would cost a lot of money. Keith Joseph, who was the uh, guru of the great Thatcher revolution of non-interventionism, was against me because it was a massive piece of interventionism. So I had no friends except one, to your great surprise, Marjorie. And a meeting took place in number 10 one night in which the four of us, Keith, Jeffrey, myself, and Margaret, and Jeffrey, and Margaret turned to Jeffrey and said, what do you think? We can't do it, Margaret. It's government and spending is out of control. And here's another example of another quite unnecessary. Keith, what do you think? This is Margaret, this is exactly what we said we would not do. Well, Michael, it doesn't look as though you've got a friend or two in here. What do you think? I thought, well, Margaret, I, I'm so keen on Jeffrey's cost-cutting agenda, and I'm absolutely passionate for Keith's uh, 
um, um, non-intervention policy, but I've been talking to Reg Prentice, who's recently joined us, Margaret, you'll know he used to be a Labour Member of Parliament in the East End, and I've been talking to him about the problems there, and he said, and, and Margaret, the real problem we've got is that all the councillors there are communists. It was like lighting a blue touch paper. I came out having got agreement to my development cooperation. And uh, officials threw one last gasp, said, oh, Secretary of State, what a triumph. How did you pull it off? Uh, but of course, it will need hybrid legislation, Secretary of State, as you know, because you're just doing London. And you can't do that as a minister. You cannot legislate for a person or a place. You can only do it for generality, all people or all places. So I said, well, that's all right. Find me the second worst place. Where is it? They said, Liverpool. I said, fine. Take general powers. We'll do London and Liverpool. So by this time, I was a partner. I'd done the, I had plans for the development corporation. I wanted to do greening of urban dereliction. And so I knew of a scheme which had been used extensively in war-torn Europe called garden festivals. You're a property developer. You're not going to go onto contaminated land. It's much cheaper to go onto green fields. So what the Europeans have done is to take all these bomb sites, turn them into gardens, effectively. The state cleaned up the mess, greened it over. The private sector then built houses. So I created a garden festival. Uh, there were several of them, but the first was in Liverpool. Uh, uh, Peter Walker, when he, I first worked for him, had created a grant mechanism called Derelict Land Grant. And he uh, used that to get rid of the ore tips and the coal tips and all the spoilage that had been part of the extractive industries in the countryside. By 1979, the job was done, but the grant mechanism remained. And so I thought, well, what I will do, I'll use that to clean up derelict land in urban areas so that, again, the private sector can come to develop it. But instead of saying to local authorities, you can have this money, I want you to tell me what you will arrange to do with the land once I've cleared it. That was a very important decision because not only was I going to spend what the taxpayer could afford, but I was going to get gearing, additional money, because the house builders would build on the land. So all of this in 1979. But something else came from that announcement, because the tensions between the left and right of politics at that time were very acute. Remember, you won't remember, but in fact, the, government, the Thatcher government was elected after the Labour government had been almost brought to its knees in the winter of discontent, when they couldn't even bury the dead. There were so many strike problems going on. So the, the tensions between left and right were acute, and the public and private sector employees sort of shouted abuse at each other from the tops of mountains, you know, idle civil service, the form filling, bureaucrats easy money, exploiting the poor, all that sort of stuff. Uh, but if you said to them, look, here is this piece of land which is derelict. As a taxpayer, I'm going to clean it up. And you are going to have a chance to build a house on it. Something changes. Instead of shouting abuse, they get into the valley and they become friends. And that was one of the consequences of 1979. And the last big one of that agenda was the Albert Dock, a wonderful, I don't know if any of you know it, but if you ever go to Liverpool, you'll see it, a wonderful, iconic Docklands of the, uh, it would have been 18th century. Uh, and they were about to knock it down for a property developer. I stopped them, I listed it. So my involvement with Liverpool, classic ministerial, I worked out the ideas, Development Corporation, Garden Festival, Derelict Land Grant, listing buildings, up I was going, the, the, I was now Secretary of State, up the ladder of political preferment in the cabinet, absolutely classic process. Now I come to the point of my lecture, which is the world turned upside down. They rioted in 1981, 
they burnt significant public buildings and private buildings in Liverpool. And I felt a personal responsibility. I was their partner. I had done all these things, which I thought was good as could be done in the circumstances. So I said to Margaret, look, Margaret, law and order is fundamental. We have to back the police. But I, I think it's more complicated than that. And I would like your permission to walk the streets of Liverpool and just try to get under the skin of it all, try and find out what's it all about, why does this atmosphere exist? And she agreed. The non-interventionist Thatcher agreed that one of her cabinet ministers should actually leave his day-to-day -day job and walk the streets of one of the big cities. Well, it was a fascinating experience, and I only limited the amount of time to talk to you about it, but um, it was, in, in many ways, well, in, in, there's no doubt at all, it was formative in my politics and in the way I have seen my life unfold. First few days, how oh, very nice to see you, Secretary of State, and uh, very good of you to come, and we quite understand the urgency. It took a riot, of course, but that's what brought you there, here, and, and, and uh, uh, how good of you. Uh, I talked to lots of people, and um, I heard all sorts of views, and they all knew what was wrong. You were wrong, he was wrong, she was wrong, they were wrong, everybody was wrong, except me. It was not my fault. It was your fault, but particularly their fault. And there was absolutely no leadership. There was no one who was going to do anything about it, except bellyache about how everyone else has got it wrong. But after about five days, the tone began to change. Well, such a state. You've been here now for five days. You've been everywhere. We've seen you all over the newspapers, and you've had lots of conversations. What are you going to do about it? Oh, I thought, I'm in trouble. Uh, and I was, because of course, here I was, Secretary of State, huge government budgets, huge political power. What was I gonna do? So I realized that I couldn't leave the city and just disappear and say, well, I'm your partner and it'll all be all right on the night and good luck. So I produced a list of some 30 ideas. And uh, it's quite interesting looking back. Uh, I'd already got the Garden Festival underway. I would got the Development Corporation underway. But the, the Tate of the North was an empty shell. So we had to get private sector people in to start developing it. And now it is, I think it has millions of visitors a year, huge tourist input into Liverpool. The um, Toxteth Rats took place, as I said, and uh, we did two things. First, we got a lot of new social housing through the uh, housing corporation but we created training centers for the um, young unemployed in Toxteth. We, there was a derelict, land, a derelict piece of land called uh, near Wavertree. Uh, I went to GEC, uh, Gen, sorry, General Electric and to, no, it wasn't, it was, sorry, it was Plessy. Plessy and to, I think it was British Rail who owned the land. And I said, look, if I clean the land, will you take internal activities in your company, like you have a printing works or whatever it is inside your serving your own company, will you turn it into a freestanding business so that it has a chance to create its own entity, expand in its own way? Today, Wavertree Industrial Park is full of small businesses, which created an idea that how you regenerate. The, I got a phone call from a guy in St. Helens 
where a major company was laying people off. And so he had created an enterprise agency, which was simply sitting in an office advising people how to get a better job or a new job. And we took that idea and years later it became Business Link, which was established across the country on a much bigger scale. Another uh, phone call and a group of people wanted to clean up the urban fringe around our towns and villages and cities. And you'll all know about it. You go to where the housing stops, there's litter, an old pram thrown away, an old bicycle thrown away. And this group of people wanted to go to all these areas and um, use volunteers to create cleanup activity. It's now called Groundwork, a huge organization, which all came at that time. I was at the wrong end or the right end rather of a phone call from the Labour leader of Nosley, one of the Liverpool boroughs. And um, he said, look, uh, we've got this place called Cantrell Farm. And it is rat infested. It's a, a third occupied. It's filthy. We can't get anyone to live there. And if they go there, they leave. We need some help. And I said to him, look, I, I must be frank. I'll try to find some way of helping you. But I, you must give me this assurance that if I come forward with some proposal, which you could argue was uh, in the ethos of my party, you won't object to it on party political grounds. And I'll never forget what he said. He said, look, we've tried everything. I will give you that assurance. I sold this slum to the Abbey National Building Society and Barclays Bank. How I did it <laughs> to this day, I don't know. I put in a guy as a manager and Cantrell Farm has become Stockbridge Village Trust. It is now full. The house builders built houses. Laurie Barrett of Barrett's, a very good pioneering house builder, uh, built houses alongside for sale. We, we managed and ran the uh, Cantrell Farm effectively and properly and decently. It is now a model of how you can have urban regeneration. I said to my private secretary one day, look, there's something missing here. Where are all the big owners of Liverpool? Because there's no one in charge, you see. I mean, this city, like all our great cities, if you go to any of their town halls, all around the walls are the great figures who built these cities. And they were buccaneers. They, were, they built the empire. They were an extraordinary lot of people. And they did their best, some of them anyway, to endow culturally and socially to deal with some of the worst effects of the poverty and the overcrowding and the slum conditions that the Industrial Revolution created. But they've all gone. Their companies are now quoted companies in the city of London. The, the, the properties are owned by the great institutions, insurance companies. Uh, in, in again, remote. So if you're going to have these riots in our cities, somebody better tell these guys sitting in London that it's their properties that are going to be burnt next. So I'm going to hire a bus. And private secretary, I want you to get on to the bosses of the 30th biggest institutions and invite me to join, invite them to join me. <sighs> Yes, said you said. Um, second day, how are we getting on? <laughs> uh, so, well, we've made the phone calls. Um, no, we haven't actually got anyone yet. Um, but uh, well, but it's early days, said you said. Yeah, you better try harder. One of my political colleagues knew the chairman of one of the banks and got on to them. And after about six days, we had seven or eight of the bosses. That would have been a disaster. Um, and then on the seventh day, 
Secretary of State, you'll be pleased to hear I've had a phone call from one of the bosses of one of these institutions who wasn't on our list. And the phone call went rather like this. Is that the, secretary, the private sector of the Secretary of State? Yes, it is. Well, I'm, I'm very glad to get the chance to talk to you because um, my chairman understands that you've got a busload of his colleagues going around Liverpool and he hasn't been invited. Oh, of course, what an oversight that is. He will be delighted. We filled the bus. And um, it, it was a very moving experience because we took them to the worst parts of Liverpool and all these wonderfully, beautifully dressed and coiffed gentlemen, and they're all gentlemen, got out, met and talked to the tenants, and several of them said, well, of course, I was born in this city, but they were now in London. And um, they'd obviously been briefed carefully to watch me. He's a devious devil, he would have been, they'd have been told. He's after your money. So after the bus, we took them to the Adelphi Hotel in Liverpool, and they all lined up, all 30 of them, looking like this, as I got up to speak. And I said, let me say, first of all, I don't want your money. <laughs> all these happy, smiling faces left. I want one thing from you. I want you to name one of your young people, one of your brighter young executives to join me and a team from the public sector civil service in a financial institutions group to study how you can play a more positive role in preserving and enhancing the assets upon which your companies depend. And we did it and it was helpful. And we produced a report and it introduced change. But of course, I had my list. I had officials, but I knew that absolutely nothing would happen because who was gonna do it? And this is why I spent so much time talking to you about Stepney and building and my experience in the private sector because in the end that's what i am i am a private sector entrepreneur i spent 18 months and we had a, a notebook each page of which was a project one of the 30 projects and on a thursday night i would go back to liverpool and have a meeting with my task force and we'd go over every page in the book and we would um, troubleshoot the next day. Anything going wrong? I was there on the Friday to clean it up, sort it out, remove the obstacles. So I became the clerk of works. I became the minister for Merseyside, as it was known. And it was the most extraordinary experience because you see, from all those humble beginnings in Swansea, up the ladder, to the pinnacle at which you looked down and told them what to do, I was suddenly at the bottom end trying to make it happen and showing the people at the bottom end it could be done. The world was turned upside down. And I, I, I look back on that time. One other last example, the meeting's over late at night, in the Atlantic Tower Hotel, panoramic view of the Mersey. And uh, I looked out at that and I saw an open sewer because that's what it was. And I thought, this, we can't allow this. And I announced a campaign to clean the Mersey from the tiniest tributaries to the sea. And 25 years later, the seals and the salmon were back in the Mersey. And one day, someone will finish the job and really eliminate deposits into the sea, into the river. And that will be a world first because in your lifetime, clean urban water is going to be one of the great issues that people will demand. And Liverpool, in my estimation, has a chance to be a world pace setter in that sense. One, I went back to the Department of the Environment under John Major in 1990. And two things that I was involved in which uh, were important to me. First, I mentioned to you the Stockbridge Village Trust born out of Cantrell Farm, one slum conversion. 
I mentioned derelict land grants, cleaning up toxic waste. But the, the challenge was the slums. Now, everybody knows where they are. You go to any local authority and they'll tell you and they can show you, but everybody knows. So I decided to have to use my derelict land grant in a more ambitious, socially constructive way. Instead of just reclaiming the land, I would try to rebuild the communities in these deprived situations. And I injected another highly controversial concept into doing that competition. I invited 30 local authorities, they were largely la all labor, I think, to bid for a pot of money of 35 million pounds, 7 million a year over five years. And they had to show me how they would use that money in order to transform the community of such deprivation. Uh, you can imagine that this was controversial from people who said you cannot use social deprivation in such highly controversial ways by injecting competition. If the job has to be done, you should treat them all fairly. All 30 should be given a government scheme imposed on them. No, 10 will be invited to prepare their ideas. And not only that, but they will be asked in putting forward their bid to say what they will add to the 35 million that the taxpayer was offering. It was very controversial and it worked. Uh, to any of you who know Manchester, the Hume estate in Manchester was a deck access rat ridden slum. Today, it is part of the center of Manchester. Um, consequences on the competition were fascinating. First of all, because of this top down approach, transport, housing, education, health, all telling everybody what to do functionally from the center. And so all of these baronies of power in Whitehall had their branch offices, transport, county surveyor, home office, chief constable, education, chief education officer. There was no community. There was just baronies of power, functional power. And so when I said to the local authorities, you've got to build a community proposal and the conditional will be adding to it and conditional will be consulting within the community. That in itself was transformational, but something else happened. The functional departments who never spoke actually had to speak because they couldn't prepare the plans unless they interrelated with each other. Birmingham lost in the first round, and I remember why they lost, because I was in, uh, listening to their proposals and I turned to the leader whom I knew quite well and liked, Maud, and I said, uh, well, how, what do the local head teachers think about this proposal? He said, oh, no, we'll tell them. He lost, but that was the approach. Anyway, 10-1, outcry from 20 losers, but not for long, because there was another round next year. And the 20 all went off to the 10. How did you do it? What's the way? What's the trick? Next year, many more winners. And so City Challenge was to me one of the most exciting pieces of human endeavor in, this, in the world of deprivation. I also, with less success, tried remembering the Stockbridge Village Trust to um, 
give council estates a sense of self-management. And we did legislate to do something along those lines, but it never, in my view, really got very far off the ground. It's something I wish I had gone back with more energy to pursue later. Uh, in my early stages in the Department of the Environment with Peter Walker, the Redcliffe Maud report of 19, is it 1968 had looked at the structure of local government. And most of local government was built around historic structure, quite understandable. What was the one thing you knew? There was only one or two real means of communication. You either walked or you rode. And so you needed lots of local authorities close to people. But by the time we'd got to the 1960s, I mean, cars everywhere, rail, telephone, transformation. There were 1,300 local authorities. And Redcliffe Maud looked at all of this and said, you need 60, 1,300 down to 60. Peter Walker, as the conservative cabinet minister responsible, couldn't get the party to agree to getting rid of the two-tier structure which Redcliffe Maud proposed because a huge proportion of the councillors were actually the leading office holders in the local branches of the Conservative Party. They were the foot soldiers who in election time would be out there knocking on doors to get their member of parliament elected as councillors. And so the idea that you're going to get labor, the, 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 the members of parliament to turn around and abolish the foot soldiers was unthinkable. Uh, so Peter did his best and we got from um, 1,300 to 300. I became involved at that stage. And so I never was part of the initial consultation uh, and discussion that led to the decision to only go to 300 as opposed to the 60. But anyway, I became involved as Peter's lieutenant because he sent me to all the trouble spots where conservatives were being abolished, all the men were going, where tiny authorities were being amalgamated. And I, I got chased out of more conservative meetings than I can remember as, as I tried to explain the virtues of efficiency to councillors who are going to lose their jobs. Um, but uh, anyway, the, the, the 1300 became 300. And uh, it fell to me unbelievably after I'd left office in 19. Uh, 97 when the conservatives lost the election i i went back to haymarket to my company uh david cameron asked me that when he was in opposition to revisit liverpool and he came to uh, liverpool with me and i did a report with terry leahy who was the boss of tesco at the time um, and the transformation was incredible We sat and listened, and they all came in, all sorts of public, private employees of one sort or another. They all knew what they wanted to do. All we had to do was to put it all in a report, which is what we did. We made very little contribution in terms of new ideas. The only new idea was to extend the cleaning of the Mersey. But by and large, the whole psychology of the Mersey conurbation had transformed in that intervening period. David liked my report and asked me to do another one called It Took a Riot. And I'm sorry, <laughs> no stone unturned. It Took a Riot was the report I did after my eight, the 1981 riot. Um, no stone unturned was a report into the structure of how central government and local government should be reformed to make it our, our country world competitive. And uh, by and large, that's the agenda that I'm still engaged in. Uh, and with the help of uh, David Cameron, George Osborne and Greg Clark, we managed to get mayors into the, the major metropolitan areas. 
we still have a two-tier system in many of the counties. And uh, we are now in a position where Michael Gove has been made chairman of a committee of the baronies of power in order to look at the devolution agenda. It's taken two years, it's too long. It should have happened after the last election when clear promises were made. But um, the, the now, any day now, there's going to be a new white paper talking about how devolution can actually be developed. And I look forward to it. But uh, I'm grateful to you for listening to what is a detailed personal explanation of a journey in which having made assumptions so easy to make for a young person on the outset of their career to find so many of the assumptions turned upside down halfway through was an exciting and formative moment. Thank you.